so let me uh, welcome Ruben Falk um, on variation on minimum variance. And uh, Ruben is managing director uh, of the market development at the uh, firm uh, SP Capital IQ. Uh, so Hi, thank you. I will go through uh, an empirical study on uh, constructing low volatility or minimum variance strategies. Uh, the agenda is to give you a little bit of an introduction to the S&P Capital IQ organization for just a minute and then go through a little bit of background on equity market performance from a style perspective and we'll look at the tools we're using to construct the minimum variance portfolio uh, look at the features of the basic uh, unconstrained portfolio and uh, comparative performance uh, against their main benchmarks and then we'll look at the um, impact on fat in the air and performance of the chosen constraint, uh, constraints and styles, uh, sectors and, and country mentality uh, to make the portfolio more investable and we'll look at the, uh, the comparative performance across Europe, the US and Asia. So this is just a quick introduction to the S&P Capital IQ organization. Uh, over the past uh, few years, we've put together uh, a whole host of assets that we've acquired uh, over a long time. So now we have an integrated approach to both uh, credit and equity research, uh, both from a desktop platform perspective as well as from a feed perspective. And we invite you to come in and chat with us about that. Um, so this is just a little bit of background. Uh, you know, last year or two, we've seen a challenging environment in, in the markets. Um, flows have gone into uh, passive investment strategies uh, and into fixed income, and in turn that's created pressures on fees for uh, investment managers. And so, um, you know, in response, there's been a, a trend towards more systematic um, investment processes. Um, as well as the alternative data strategies and, and, and ways of essentially controlling costs by using uh, quant. So quant has sort of come back, but in a, you know, in a different flavor than during uh, 2006, 2007. It's now more of a, a needed sort of support feature of uh, more traditional um, fundamental investment processes. But nevertheless, it's back. It's just usually not how you go out and, and, and raise money in the sort of uh, uh, investment uh, management industry as a whole. Uh, in particular, looking at 2013, you know, it was, it was a hard year to outperform. Um, you know, obviously, last night, a lot of awards were given out, so it was not, in, not impossible. And, you know, some, some, some folks did very well. Um, however, the you know, hedge fund industry overall lacked the major indices, lacked behind the major indices. Um, as well as you know, many of active managers uh, didn't quite uh, you know, perform as, as well as, as, as you might have hoped. And, and some of the reasons that have been given have to, to do with you know, general macroeconomic uncertainty, the debt crisis in Europe, uh, use of outside forces, <coughs> you know, more sort of microeconomically oriented strategies, difficult to, um, you know, to, to predict. Um, also, you know, there's been a big shift during the year through 2012 from uh, growth to value, from risk off to risk on. And so all these sort of outside forces has made it difficult to, um, to perform. And, and, and again, this is you know, one of the drivers for a more systematic and disciplined investment process, alternative data, the more, uh, the more of a quantum ingredient uh, to, uh, to investment processes generally. Um, so the S&P Capital IQ sort of solution set, and this is sort of more generally uh, true for um, having a quant element to your process, and specifically uh, what we've used for this case study. So we have the Alpha Factor Library, which has uh, 450 factors already uh, pre-tested, pre-defined, uh, worldwide, emerging markets, developed markets. Uh, it's a graphic user interface that allows you to investigate performance of factors and themes in different markets and different regimes. So sort of the, the pre-planned uh, equity uh, factor toolbox is the kind of thing that people used to you know, spend years developing and, and trade off. And now, these days, you actually don't have to develop any of it. It's fully fledged, pre-canned, ready to go, ready to research, 
uh, in a community without really having to lift a finger. Uh, so sort of the next generation of, of, of you know, cross-sectional, um, factor-based uh, quant uh, methodology. We also use our risk model, which are based on the same factors as in the Alpac library. Uh, we use the optimization for the purpose of creating the minimum marriage portfolio, although I mean, you can create it in a much more simple way. I mean, if you use a beta rate, you'll get something similar, not quite as good, but similar. Um, and we use our, our standard uh, fact-based uh, portfolio execution framework. And these are the Alpha Tech Lab investment styles. These are also the style factors in our risk model. Right, so we have a, a little bit of a different approach to risk models in that we have uh, it's more stylistic based uh, factors and more maybe tilted towards traditional alpha factors as opposed to just traditional uh, risk factors. So we really want to be able to explain performance uh, in a way that uh, your portfolio managers can resonate with. So things like capital efficiency or capital strength may, may be a, a source of growth risk and return in a way of being able to describe the performance of your, your portfolio to, to investors. Uh, and, and probably something that is close to what you might be using in your own investment process, be it capital efficiency, be it uh, earnings quality, or the more traditional uh, value uh, and growth uh, themes. And this is just an example of um, you know performance last year in two different indices: the S&P 500 in the U.S., uh, the, the BMI Europe, similar to the sort of MSCI all comes from Europe. Um, and these are the different investment styles that we track, and what you're seeing is just the quantile one month, quantile five spread, so uh, equal way to return uh, of the companies that develop the relevant index uh, by the first, by the rank, by these different uh, style factors, the top 20% uh, average returns minus the bottom 20% average returns of companies ranked uh, by these different styles. And what you saw, during last year, both in, in, in the U.S. and in Europe, was uh, this shift from a sort of risk off to a risk on environment, which you can see in the in the red line uh, during the year. Right, so volatility started outperforming from sort of July. Um, interestingly, though, in Europe, um, as a little bit as an aside, the capital efficiency, uh, sort of financial strength style, uh, did it, you know it performed well at the beginning of the year during the risk off environment. But then even as risk came back on, uh, it actually maintained, uh, maintained performance. Right? So capital efficiency, uh, you know, in the, in the face of the, of the debt crisis in Europe, uh, has continued to hold up. This is another view of, 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 of the same sort of thing. So this is the uh, volatility style uh, and how it has performed sort of the opposite of low volatility. So this high volatility, if you will. So how the volatility style has performed. Uh, since 1990 in the various regions. And, um, so red is good for um, is good for low volatility. Uh, right? So what you'll see is that in Europe in particular, uh, low volatility strategies have performed very well, uh, and, and maybe less so in, 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 in the emerging markets overall from 1990. Although I mean, for the period you look at that can be very important, right? Because if you look at the run-up into the technology bubble, volatility clearly outperformed everywhere. Um, Whereas, you know, when you look at the, the, the run-up into the 2008 crisis, uh, you know, low volatility outperformed everything. Um, this is just a quick overview of the low volatility anomaly, right? So we would expect the middle areas portfolio to be on the efficient frontier, uh, but in fact, uh, empirically, uh, it's been shown to be above the security market line. So, you know, what, what, what gives, um, you know, the two sort of explanations that I, that, that I give more, more, most credence to is one is that in fact the security market line is not that one of the right? Because the market portfolio is in fact much broader than you know, what particularly equity, uh, uh, you know, equity analysts would typically look at, right? So maybe perhaps the market portfolio is something with a higher return and therefore perhaps the actual security market line does go through the, 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 you know, the, the empirical minimum risk portfolio. So that's one, that's one explanation. The other explanation is that um, or the one I can feed into anyway is that essentially because there's a lack of access to leverage by long only investors, that means that volatility becomes a substitute for leverage um, and therefore gets um, you know, bid up, at least temporarily, uh, to unsustainable price levels. 
And so that would be another explanation for why um, you know, high volatility stocks are not uh, rewarded uh, over time. Um, and this is just a little bit of background to you know, the research surrounding low volatility. So it's been, you know, it's, it's been researched fairly extensively uh, going back to you know, the 70s, even the 60s in the US, uh, and, and also across the world. And there is a, you know, a fair amount of evidence that over a long period of time, the low volatility anomaly is in fact real. So now I'll go into the, uh, the detailed case study, right? So we start with a billion euros long only, monthly balancing, seven years, um, minimum variance is the objective uh, in the optimizer, each rebalancing, subject to, to, to being fully invested. Uh, we use our fundamental medium term risk model, University of MSCI Europe, max 100 holdings, uh, we use a liquidity constraint at 10% of the average daily volume, and then we think that using a trade cost of uh, 25 bits, including impact, each way is, uh, is a reasonable assumption. Max holding size 3% uh, per name. And so here's the, um, here's the performance in Europe, right? So minimum variance handily outperforms uh, the index uh, and at significantly lower risk, so 10% risk versus 16 for, for the index. Uh, but with a, a fairly high tracking error of 10%, because we don't have any constraints, we don't country constraints, we don't sector constraints, we don't stock constraints. And this is really the this is the main sort of issue that, that, that low volatility managers face is how to manage the tracking error. And this is the attribution analysis of, of, of that base case uh, low volatility portfolio in, in Europe. Um, and what you see are some things that you would expect, such as you know, low beta, right? So 0.45 or so beta, which is you know, what, what low volatility portfolios typically end up with and end up, you know, which is also why you can, you know, you can select something that's very close to a minimum there's always simplify ranking on beta. Most of the return uh, is from uh, stock specific sources, uh, uh, which again has been, been shown in other studies, uh, one by Ernst Scherer um, more recently. Um, also, you know, the average model actually does a good job, right, so the uh, forecast risk over the period is 10% and realized risk is 10.1%. Um, so we're you know, right in line. Uh, the, the one thing that's a little bit, maybe not surprising, but something that I, I haven't seen before is the earnings quality exposure, right? So the minimum earnings portfolio has a very significant earnings quality exposure, which, you know, somewhat intuitive, right? Earnings quality, uh, low volatility, you know, seem to be sort of thematically uh, related. Um, but this is the kind of thing you, you would see with our model and maybe you would see with others since we have this, this desktop back window. However, it's not what contributes to return, right? So the earnings quality returns return is actually zero. Um, so constructing earnings quality, excuse me, but constructing a highly earnings quality exposed portfolio doesn't give you the minimum variance performance. However, when constructing a minimum variance portfolio, you end up with something that is uh, at least in part, a highly earnings quality source for And then we ex just extend uh, the case study to uh, US and, and Japan using our regional risk models for those two uh, regions or countries in the case of US and uh, uh, looking at the, 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 uh, the benchmarks uh, again for those two cases, MSCI US and MSCI Asia. And so here you see the, uh, the performance. So, you know, European performance and U.S. performance not too dissimilar. Although you do see it, you do see the performance tailing off. And this is active returns, right? So this is the, the, the returns compared to the relevant benchmark over time. You do see the performance tailing off in Europe over the, the last six months or so, with the, the risk on environment coming back. Um, same happens in, in Asia X Japan. I mean, interestingly, the Asia X Japan example, you know, you have very, very sharp risk on, risk off environment, right? So it's, it's an interesting place to perhaps play low volatility, but um, it's also a place where you have to be careful and, you know, during a risk off environment, excuse me, during a risk on environment, uh, it becomes a uh, big hazard in Asia. 
And here we just show the data. Right? So the, 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 the features of, of the portfolios uh, in the different regions are actually very similar. Right? They're all low beta. They all have fairly high variance quality exposure, even more so in the US and Asia. Uh, the returns, again, in all cases, outperform uh, the benchmark. Uh, stock specific sources of that return are very significant uh, as opposed to systematic sources. Um, the, the risk, again, is below the benchmark in all cases, as you would expect, since that's the objective. And tracking error in all cases is quite high. Um, looking at the weighted active weights by sector, what you find that it's, uh, again, in all regions, it's a, it's a very defensive sector allocation, right? So you, you become massively overweight in sectors such as consumer staples, utilities, telecoms, and underweight, more aggressive sectors such as technology, financial, and energy. Um, and in terms of capitalization weight, you end up being underweight in the top decile uh, by market cap, right? So the top 10% of companies by market cap, you end up being underweight. Those, you end up being correspondingly overweight the next four deciles. So you end up being actually equally equal weight in the top half and equal weight in the bottom half. Essentially, what it, it turns out to be is something that's close enough to the index that you can call it a large cap portfolio, but it's, it's, it's definitely not a mega cap portfolio, right? Because you are very underweight with very large stock. And, you know, the, I guess the reason for that perhaps is that this, the stocks that end up in the, in the mega cap uh, top 10% uh, bucket are stocks with a lot of momentum going into that, uh, you know, going, going into that, 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 that decile and probably maintains a lot of volatility after it's gone in. You know, Apple is a good example, right? It's definitely the top quintile, but it's also very volatile. Um, interestingly, Europe is the only one that shows a, um, a little bit of a, 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 a small cap bias in the, uh, in the minimum wage portfolio, which is surprising. Um, and I haven't looked into it yet in enough detail, but my guess is that there's a, a fair amount of probably allocation towards the smaller um, companies of the more stable countries. <laughs> And the periphery countries, uh, even the large caps, uh, may be more volatile and they're not picked up. Now this shows a little bit of uh, analysis of um, turnover versus return and risk. So it turns out that you can have a very low turnover strategy and achieve the same returns. So it's, uh, it's not. Uh, you don't need high turnover to get the returns of, of, of low volatility. You do get a little bit of a trade-off between risk and, and turnover, right? So you're essentially chasing low risk. And so the higher the turnover, the better you chase it, the closer you're going to get. Um, the lower turnover, you know, the, the more risk you're going to get. But I mean, but these are not big, big differences. We're talking one, one percent uh, difference between fifty percent turnover and two hundred percent turnover. Um, all right, now we're going to sort of shift gears a little bit and look at the impact of this trade. Right? So the problem with the, the base case that I've shown so far is that the tracking errors are very significant. You end up with portfolios that are not sort of mainstream investable portfolios, right? It's usually overweight consumer staples and, and, and telecom utilities, for instance. Um, so the question is how do you manage the tracking error, how do you, and how, what's the impact of managing the tracking error uh, on, on risk and return. And so the way we look into that is we look at a constraining uh, country, sector, and style exposure to uh, those of the benchmarks, the, the respective benchmarks, uh, and, and we do a plus minus 20% uh, part constraint uh, of these three um, exposure types. Um, to the, uh, the benchmark, so benchmark number of And so what you find, and I'm not, I'm not going to go through it, there's a lot of time, more than happy to talk to you about this in more detail after, or, or if you have any questions, but the, what you find essentially is that style constraints and sector constraints work differently in different regions. So in, in the US, you're better off style constraining, but in Europe, you're better off 
sex industry. Um, and that's true for both the, the risk and return profile. Um, and so, you know, I can't say I have a good, I have a good explanation of why that difference exists. Uh, but, I, but, but obviously, the, what, what is important is that you consider both, consider different ways of establishing uh, your neutrality, different ways of um, reducing your stacking error depending on the region and perhaps even depending on the period. And stock and strings, you know, it's probably not, they're probably not as popular as, as sector, sector constraints, but in certain regions, particularly in the U.S., uh, stock and string is actually uh, the way to go at this, this empirical, uh, this empirical study. And just in general, what happens when you're constrained is that, you know, market exposure goes up, right? You end up looking more like the market because you're constraining to look more like the benchmark by construction. Uh, market exposure goes up, the risk goes up because, you know, the market portfolio is more risky, and, but obviously your track layer goes down, right? That's what you were expecting. The question is really then, how do you do it? What, what kind of constraints do you pick to get this effect? <coughs> um, in terms of returns, you know, if you look more like the market, you would expect to have returns that are closer to, uh, to those of the market. Um, and that, in fact, is what you get. But again, here, you know, whether you stop constrained or sector constrained, actually makes that, you know, makes that conclusion uh, less tight, right? So in Europe, doing the sector constraint can actually get very close to the original uh, minimum variance portfolio. The, you know, the unconstrained case in terms of returns. In the US, if you stop constrained, you're actually getting even higher returns with than the original unconstrained portfolio. So there's definitely some um, there's some, some sort of playing room here for um, using different ways of neutralizing uh, exposures and, and getting uh, you know, very different results in terms of the, uh, the performance. So, with that, uh, I'm just going to summarize. So, you know, what we see is that the, the, um, you know, the unconstrained portfolio easily outperforms in all three regions, although there's been some, uh, there's been no outperformance in sort of mid-2011, uh, except in Asia, right? So, I mean, obviously, low volatility is, a, is more of a crisis strategy, but it's maintained performance, you know, benchmark-like performance, even in the upturn. Um, you know, the question is whether, you know, there's been a lot of trends around sort of regime switching and people tend to use now macroeconomic variables more for uh, really informing the investment process. So, you know, I think there's, a, there's an argument to make that low volatility in and of itself it's going to go in and out of style, and you may want to have some sort of macroeconomic overlay to find out how aggressively you want to pursue it. Um, the portfolios, you know, they, they lend themselves to sort of a, a mid cap and a large cap bias, but definitely not a mega cap bias. Uh, only in Europe, we, we see a little bit of a small cap bias. Uh, <coughs> you end up being, being overweight in traditionally defensive sectors. Uh, and end up with a high tracking error unless you, you impose uh, neutrality uh, to various, uh, various uh, groupings. And so, imposing these different constraints is what, uh, depending on the region, actually give rise to very different uh, types of performance. And so, that's, uh, that's the summary. Thank you very much. We maybe have time for one question. One question, sit down. Uh, okay. Um, how do you, um, what are your covariance um, metrics estimates based on? Are they just sample based? No, I mean, we have, we have a, a risk model that you know, is, is structurally similar to other risk models in the marketplace. Um, they're a little different in that they're time, the time series risk models, it's like exposures, time series exposures. Um, but the, essentially the after factor library that I sort of touched on briefly has these eight styles, 
you know, the gig sector is a market factor, and then we, um, you know, we construct uh, programs for agencies, receipts, bills back and returns, uh, and we measure the exposure to those uh, back and returns for each of the jobs. And the uh, yeah. correlations seem to be constant, or do we also track them out? No, we pack it up. Everything is there. I mean, so everything's here. We, we did the, you know, it's, 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 it's daily fact and returns with daily uh, correlation estimates. Although, I mean, the correlation estimate tends to be based on a fairly long time series, 180 days, the, 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 the half life or the, or the, uh, or the correlation, uh, or correlations. But the, you know, the variance of having the shorter half life to make it more reactive to changes in, in the volatility in the month. But it's all here. So let's turn to Ruben. Uh, I'm sorry, because uh, if you want to have uh, additional questions at around, uh, I say, uh, 11, 11, 15, we have a coffee break. Eventually, we may continue discussing together. Uh, so that's it. Very much, Ruben. Thank you.